We are now going to move to some very exciting cutting edge work in creating a brain implant to restore speech. I want to welcome David Moses. Dr. Moses received a BS in bioengineering from Rice University and then a PhD in bioengineering from a joint program betwe between UCSF and UC Berkeley. As a postdoctoral scholar in Dr. Chang's lab, he manages and coordinates projects for an early feasibility clinical trial at UCSF to evaluate the potential of electrocorticography and machine learning to restore speech to patients with severe paralysis. He's joined by Margaret Seaton, who is the Clinical Research Coordinator at UCSF in the Department of Neurological Surgery. Ms. Seaton is interested in involving end user needs in early assistive device development. And Poncho, who is a community member, a clinical trial participant, a communication first board member, and a powerful advocate for individuals who cannot rely on speech for communication. Welcome. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, thank you for that introduction. And of course, thanks for having us here. We're really excited to talk to you today about our research. And I think first, what's extremely exciting is we get to hear from Pancho and Margaret uh, before we get into the research part so that Pancho can describe his, can let you know who he is and describe his experience and just share his wisdom with us. So. Mm -hmm. But first we have nothing to disclose. Yeah. All right, hi everyone. So I am here, my name is Margaret. Thanks for the introduction. I'm here with Pancho Ramirez, who has written up um, a bit about his experience as a clinical trial participant and so much more. And I will, he would like me to speak for him, um, but this is everything that he's written in the slides he's created. All right. So hi, my name is Pancho Ramirez. I'm a 40, I'm 40 years old and live in Sonoma, California. It is a pleasure to have the opportunity to present before you all today. I have no experience giving presentations, so if there's anything that doesn't make sense or is out of place, I apologize beforehand. I have to get someone to read my text and speak for me. I have a speech generating device, but it sounds terrible. I don't like it to be my voice, so I asked my friend Margaret to read it for me. Today, I would like to talk about three different things that happened in my life, how I overcame them, and make the best of them. I hope I won't bore any, too, any of you too much. If so, I'm sorry. It wasn't planned. <laughs> So over 20 years ago, I was able to walk, talk, work, and provide for myself. I was a healthy, happy young man, full of dreams and with so much to look forward to. Unfortunately, fate had other plans waiting and my life was about to go in an unexpected direction. In the month of June, 2003, I suffered a car accident that led to a brainstem stroke, leaving me paralyzed and unable to speak. I've been in nursing homes and hospitals in Northern California ever since. The first day that I was able to communicate a little was when I was in a hospital in Berkeley. I don't remember which hospital I was in. I remember that I was burning up with a high fever and my family was visiting me from Sonoma. I was desperate trying to communicate something to my family, but I was not able to. I had a UTI infection that was spreading through my whole body very quickly and I was very weak. Not, nevertheless, because I couldn't stay still, my sister told me, we are going to understand whatever you are trying to tell us, somehow or another, my brother. She grabbed a piece of paper, wrote down the entire alphabet, a pen, used a pen, and pointed to each of the letters accordingly. I nodded yes or no whenever she pointed to the right character, and then I wrote it down. She wrote it down. Then around November 2003, I moved to the Healdsburg Hospital. There was a brilliant young man there. He was very nice and compassionate towards people like me, someone who was unable to help himself and communicate. He brought a laser light, attached it to a baseball cap, mm -hmm. and posted a letter board with an alphabet on the wall in front of me. 
Whenever I wanted to communicate something to the nurse or someone else, I just asked for the cap, pointed to the alphabet board on the wall, and they wrote everything down. I did not know any English yet, so it was only Spanish. As time went by, they bought a laptop and a baseball cap with a stick pointer attached to it for me to use. I believe the purpose was to keep me entertained and to communicate better. I was delighted. Even though I did not know how to use a computer before, it was a new thing for me. It took me a long time to get the hang of it and learn all the basics, but I did, more or less. By then, I knew a bit of English, and I could write on the computer's Word document, whatever I needed to tell the nurses and other staff. I used this way to communicate and operate a computer for 14 years. Now my neck hurts just to think about it. And we'll show you a video later of Pancho using this um, communication device. In June 2020, the researcher from UCSF gave me a head mouse. You can see he's using it in this, this picture here. It's called the Qizono. I immediately fell in love with this little gadget. I could do everything so much easier, faster, and more efficiently. I had to be as close as possible to my desk and lean forward so I could reach my keyboard with the baseball cap to hit a letter one by one. And that was with the old method. Suddenly, I didn't have to do that anymore with my new mouse. It enhanced my life and my computer usability tremendously. It comes in two pieces. One is the USB, the receiver. It connects to the computer and automatically pairs both devices. The second one, the mouse, could be on your head, your glasses, um, or like in a headband. Then one may use a virtual keyboard that computers have built in, and then you can type or navigate through the internet as you need. The researchers also gave me a laser pointer and a letter board. I can have them in my bag all the time and use them on the go if necessary. And this, that's this picture. Yeah? Oh, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit slower. I think the closed captioning is having a difficult time capturing. Oh, yes. Yeah, no, definitely. Okay, sorry about that. No, don't worry. I tend to speak quickly, so. <laughs> okay, go to our next one here. So this is about Poncho's experience living in a nursing home. So in January, 2007, I was transferred to a nursing home in Sonoma, California. My family was living there, so they thought it would be better for me to be close to family members. I've been living in this nursing home for 16 years. Although at first it was difficult to get used to living in a skilled nursing facility, I was scared to be surrounded by elderly people only. I felt like I was there because it was my final destination, as sadly it is for some elderly folks. Fortunately, my sister, her husband, and many friends who never leave me alone gave me their support and I got through it. Not only that, but while being in the nursing home, I taught myself English, earned my GED and a web developer certificate. I got a power chair as well. And you can see Poncho's in his power chair now. And I can go out by myself into the community at any time. I'm happy about it because it means that I am not locked in the facility, unable to go anywhere as many elderly folks are. I have built a living that is more meaningful, decent and happier through self-advocacy and the help of professional people. However, I always dream of having my own place and living in the community. Sorry, there's a, I hope it'll stop. Um, by myself, even in the disability conditions I am. Yes, I have freedom at the place where I am, but it's limited regardless. I have to share the room with one more person. I have to keep my computer quiet if watching movies or something else, I have no say going to bed and getting up in the early morning. The workers have their scheduled time for the day that we have to follow. I have no say in the hours to eat. It is a set schedule for everyone. The food, same thing. You have to eat whatever is on the menu. Also, I don't have privacy and can't be alone. Nurses and staff are constantly in and out of the room. I am a board member of an awesome organization and I have board meetings and other video calls and often I get interrupted by someone. In addition, I have no space for my personal items. Maybe you can fit the most essential stuff, but not much. Recently, someone was donating a new desk, but I couldn't get the one I wanted because it didn't fit. The list keeps going on and on. 
I don't think a skilled nursing facility or a nursing home should be for anyone. It's very sad and lonely for anyone to be in a place like this. One can't sometimes even get outside of your own room because you can't wheel yourself around. Yes, there are people to help the residents, nursing staff, but they dress you up and get you ready for the day. The nursing staff doesn't help you get around or go wherever you wish. They put you in your wheelchair, wheel you out of your room, maybe into the activities area, and that's it. You'll be left there until after lunch or dinner when it is time to go back to bed. I was living in this condition for six years. I felt like a plant for the building. You just need to water it so it won't dry up and keep it alive. Furthermore, you have to share the room with two or three other people. I am in a room with two beds only, but I was in luck because there were just three rooms like that. In my experience, living in a nursing home is terrible. Unless you can fend and advocate for yourself, maybe you can build a decent living like I did, then you'll probably be okay. And as we had mentioned, Poncho is a participant in the clinical trial here that we had mentioned. So talk a little bit about that experience as well. In the year of 2018, I got involved in a clinical trial conducted by UCSF in San Francisco. I was the first participant in the study. The researcher, research was about helping paralyzed people to control a robot arm and to give voices to those who have lost the ability to speak or have never spoken before. They required me to have a surgery on my head to implant electrodes. It is called ECOG, electrocorticography, but I just called it a microchip on the surface of the brain. Then this microchip was going to be the bridge between a computer system and my brain, so the researchers could work on it. I had the surgery to implant the electrodes in my brain on Monday, February 25th, 2019. It has been over four years now. A long time, isn't it? It feels like it was done yesterday. Having the implant has been, more or less, in terms of it being in my head, okay. I do get light headaches occasionally. I feel like my neck is a little weak and my head weighs too much, but not so bad or uncomfortable. I can't wet my head also. So whenever I take a shower, it has to be done from my shoulders down. The nurses wash my head and it is done with a special treatment. Although at the beginning, the doctors did it for a while just to make sure that it was healing well. I have to keep my head bald. Well, I could have just shaved the spot where the connector is, but I think it's better to cut all of my hair. <laughs> the first day of the actual study began the month of March, 2019. It is composed of two teams, one in charge of robotics and the other in charge of speech. They started coming five times per week. At first, the experiments were done in the nursing home. Then they rented an office next to the facility where I am. The robotics team was the first one to start coming. They used a dot on a big screen at first. I had to make it move up and down, right and left. It was a nice task. However, where was the robot arm? I thought <laughs> when I signed up for the clinical trial and I read the details of what it was about, I was very excited to get involved, but I didn't pay much attention to the speech part. I did think it was great, but my focus was more on robotics. I've always been hopeful of getting some body movement to be able to help myself in some way, to at least feed myself. Everything else would get much easier. Communicating would be a piece of cake. I didn't see anything that was close enough, like a robotic arm though. The next day was about speech and it was pure data collection every day. For data collection, I have to say, try to say the same word over and over again. I remember the first time when we started and it was about data collection every day. I thought, oh, Dios mio, my goodness. <laughs> Are you trying to make me speak again? Why did I sign up for this? I was starting to really regret that, just like in school. I wasn't much of a good student who loves going to school. No, not at all. I was going to school because I got in trouble if I didn't. Anyways, the rewards would come soon, awesome ones. I've been enjoying this clinical trial very much. Indeed, everything is incredible. Since we first started with the robotics team, we transitioned from the dot on the big screen to a thing called, <clears throat> excuse me, 
an exoskeleton that was on a map table. They had me trained on that for quite a while. Then we went back to training on the big screen with the dot, and then they started training me in a virtual environment with a robot arm. Then, there we go, they began with the actual robot arm. I feel very happy with the robot arm and the fact that I can make it move with my brain. Blows my mind. <laughs> now with the other study, speech decoding, it is a totally different experience. After days, weeks of collecting data, the team said, okay, Poncho, time for the truth. We are going to do our first real-time decoding attempt. I was sort of nervous. They said, just try your best. Don't worry if it doesn't work. It's not the end of the world. We will still collect the data, take it back, make some adjustments, and then try again. Needless to say, it did work. I was very happy. I couldn't believe it. I have a spontaneous laughter that comes out of nowhere for no reason, and I have a hard time controlling it and putting myself together. On that day, I started laughing and laughing, and I thought it would never stop. I was telling myself, please calm down. You can do it. Erase that stupid laughter. You look like a dummy. <laughs> I kept saying that in my head over and over, and I did it. I took con control of myself back and continued the recording session. Phew. <laughs> my experience has been pretty amazing during all these years, although it has not been great all the time. I do get tired sometimes, as well as bored, very bored. Nevertheless, my research teams, I dare to call them my teams from UCSF, are great, very nice, and fun. They make all the sessions go fast and smoothly. They give me snacks. They take me to my favorite place, Dutch Bros Coffee, to get coffee if I want, and they make jokes. They do their best to keep me engaged and entertained. Overall, both studies are breathtaking. I know that they are very important, each one in its own way. I didn't realize that the clinical trial could be beneficial, not just for me, but for individuals who, like me, can't speak, communicate, and help themselves in any way. I'm very happy to know that. Every day I have a recording session, I am full of excitement and happiness. It is a sad day when I'm not doing a session. Being able to participate in the clinical trial has been a life-changing experience. It is great to be a participant, but it is a beautiful feeling knowing that you are contributing to the well-being of people throughout the country, perhaps the whole world with the clinical trial. So if you have the chance to participate in something that could be beneficial for you as well as others, do it. Don't hesitate. You will be glad you did. Thank you for listening. And there actually is a few more videos that I would like to show here that kind of put a little bit of what we talked about into, so you can see it. Hopefully everyone can see this. So here's Poncho doing the data collection that we talked about. <laughs> it's kind of the setup in the room. And Poncho's training the, um, doing training data collection. So he's miming words along that we can collect that data and use it to train models. And then this is the other side of the study, the robot arm. So this Poncho is moving this with his mind, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of hard work. So, and this is about communication methods that Poncho uses um, kind of separately from the trial. So this first part here, this is the hat with the stick on it that Poncho used to communicate with. Get your GED like this. <laughs> um, this is the one that hurt his neck. As you can tell, mm -hmm. could certainly hurt a neck. The 
This is the kind of on the go communication board that Puncha will use. There's a laser attached to glasses that he's using to um, point to words and letters. Yeah, so that is the conclusion of Poncho's section. So thank you, Poncho, for writing out the really incredible story. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Poncho. He says thank you as well for listening. Great. OK, well, now that you got a glimpse of Pancho's journey. I'm here to tell a little bit more about focusing on the, the research itself. And um, we can just go ahead and get started. So you've already seen a little bit about when those videos, what can be done with what we refer to as a brain computer interface, which is generally a connection between someone's brain and computers. And so in this, but just to summarize, the overall concept of a BCI for short is that you have a user and a neural interface, such as what's shown here. And then the electrical signals are recorded and processed and used to control some kind of output, whether that be displaying something on a screen or controlling a robotic device. So the goal for brain computer interfaces for movement and communication is to facilitate interactions with devices and surroundings. For example, Poncho has expressed that he would like to be able to feed himself, again, using a BCI. So that is an example of a, a goal of a brain-computer interface. And so, for example, in this study um, from 2017, someone who was paralyzed was using their brain-computer interface to spell out messages on a screen. Just to give a brief overview of how this type of technology can function, you know, our brain acts as a control center. So there's a portion of the brain, the visual cortex, that helps you interpret what our eyes see. There's another brain that plays a role in understanding what you hear. And then there's this region that we refer to as the motor cortex that controls, al allows us to control many of our voluntary movements, such as moving your arms, speaking, and so forth. And it's this area, the motor cortex, that our lab and our research is primarily focused on because we want to understand the mechanisms of how this area controls articulation, controls speaking. Okay, and so we have done studies using this particular type of brain computer interface where there's a series of electrical sensors that are surgically implanted on the brain surface. So you can see here in this illustration, um, these, each one of these sensors can record electrical activity from neurons that are underneath the sensor. And we use that to get a, a view into the brain and to understand the mechanisms that's driving different types of behavior. And so just to briefly go over mm -hmm. one kind of uh, study, which was done in our, in our lab, um, we found that different parts, so this is a brain surface in the background and these dots are different electrodes, different sensor locations. And we've found that certain regions are more tuned to certain sounds. So the sounds of these consonants in day, say, and noon are in green. And we found that this, you can see that there's a, a clustering, like certain brain areas basically within this tiny region are more or more preferentially tuned to different sounds. And so the blue can be these different sounds and so forth. And so one of our goals was to say, okay, we know how this maps onto brain activity. And you can see this is just um, a visualization of the signals that we record. And so once you have those models, you can actually invert this mapping to decode speech. And this is one of the goals of the group is to go from brain activity while someone is saying something and to decode from the activity itself what the person was trying to say 
be it as text or maybe as a speech waveform, as the sounds of speech itself. So now all of this work that I've shown so far has been in patients who are able to speak, who volunteer for these studies while they're getting um, treatment for epilepsy actually. But we want to understand for someone like Poncho, who is unable to speak, when they try to speak, do we see similar patterns? And if so, can we actually decode what they're attempting to say from these patterns? Because that would enable us to bypass paralysis and to restore the ability to communicate through speech. And so to this end, we've started the Bravo clinical trial, which is jointly led by Dr. Chang on the speech side and Dr. Ganguly on the motor side, the, for example, the robot arm side. So for our goals, we want to study the brain representations of speech in people who are unable to speak, such as Poncho. We want to understand if our approach is safe and viable for a long-term solution. And then ultimately, we want to create a speech neuroprosthesis, a speech brain computer interface to help patients communicate again. And so as you already know by now, Poncho has become our first participant, which we're extraordinarily fortunate for and grateful for. And this picture is actually a, an illustration based on the location of the implant in or on the surface of Poncho's brain, covering his uh, motor cortex, okay? And so we have 128 electrodes. And just to give you an example of what this looks like. So here we're showing raw brain activity that is recorded from our device. And you can see that the dots lighting up are the different activations of the electrode sensors. And this is showing a, a time course of the electrical activity across many channels. And we're capturing a thousand snapshots per second. So it's, it's a good amount of data. But as you, it may, you know, this is during Poncho's attempts to speak. And so I think it's fairly obvious, at least for any of us looking that it'd be really hard to figure out by eye what he's trying to say. So this is one of the main challenges is how do we go from this to reconstruct his message? One thing that's needed that's shown here is that Poncho has to say, he has to try to say the words many times for us to get a good understanding of what the signal. So you can see this red line as an average across many repeats of the same word. And you can see at first it's very noisy, but as he says it over and over again, as he tries to say it, and we get more information, we get a better sense of what the average, the typical activity is um, from this sensor. Okay, and I'm gonna kind of go through this a little bit quickly, but this is kind of an overview of the first speech BCI that we developed. And so just to walk you through it, there's, in this example, there's a prompt such as, how are you today? Now, Poncho is trying to respond and his brain activity is acquired by the implant and is then processed. So just very briefly, what's happening is that the neural signals are processed. Um, it's just some techniques we do to get the signals in a form that we can more easily work with. And then we actually detect when he's trying to speak from the brain activity itself. You know, we don't use a microphone or anything here. We can find certain patterns that are associated with him trying to speak as opposed to him just idling, just resting. And then when we have these uh, events, these speech events, we then pass them through a model that gives us word probabilities from the neural activity. And so right now, this is a 50 word vocabulary in this first implementation. And so we're predicting the likelihood of all these 50 words from the brain activity. And then finally, we use a language model such as, you know, uh, ones that are built into, for example, Siri or Alexa that have an understanding of likely sentences. You know, I am very good is more likely to be said than I am very glasses, for example. And so using this kind of information with what we decode from brain activity, we can finally decode full sentences and display them back on the screen. And so this is an example of us doing just that. So in this prompt, how are you today? Pancho is now trying to speak and to say his response, and we are decoding the response from his brain activity in real time. 
So you can see it, it does get this sentence right. And so he's able to respond to this question purely from his brain activity and while he's trying to speak. And just to give you a little understanding of how the language model helps. So let's say that these are the target sentences. This is a different task where he's just trying to say a target sentence. So we show him a sentence and he tries to repeat that aloud. And you can see without the language model, it makes some mistakes. But when you mm -hmm. add in the language model, you know some of these more unlikely sentences get corrected and we get the closer to the true output. So overall, we were about 75% accuracy at about 15 words per minute, which we thought was a really promising start because this is, you know, Pancho basically is the first person in history to show that this is possible. Um, this had never been shown before. Now, in our next study, we wanted to go beyond 50 words. So there is one way to naturally do that, and that's through spelling. This way, you know, if you can spell something out, you have access to practically unlimited vocabulary, which is something that we wanted to go to. Now, we wanted to try this with a twist, though, because just how single letters can get lost, do, let's say you were saying single letters to someone spelling something out over a phone, or if it was loud, sometimes it can be hard to hear. Now, this is, a, this is kind of a solved problem in this using something called the NATO alphabet, which is instead of saying A, you say alpha, bravo for B, Charlie, and so forth. And so we thought maybe this noise uh, effect might happen in brain signals <laughs> because there's a lot of things going on in the brain and it can be difficult to pull out exactly what the intent was whenever you scan these neural signals. So we had Pancho try to use the NATO alphabet to spell instead of single letters. And so here's something that Pancho was able to achieve using the system. So it's a slight twist on what we did before. But instead of only having 50 words, Puncher here is able to spell out what he wants to say by just trying to say these NATO code words to represent the letters. And so here is an open-ended response. So Puncher can say kind of anything that he wants uh, within actually a thousand word vocabulary now. So much more access to, to different words. And so this is what he spelled out to us. This was, by the way, during the I guess, some of the heights of the COVID pandemic. And so you can see there's some language modeling too, but he's able to spell out, you all stay safe from the virus here. Okay, now to go over a little bit in more detail what these results look like. So one other thing that our model did was it used our understanding of language to automatically insert spaces. And so when we don't have that language model here, we can see that it can be a little bit difficult to figure out exactly what he's trying to say. Now, some of these you can probably infer, I do not want that, or tell me about your family. But when we add in the language model, we see really, really nice results um, where the target sentence that Pancho was trying to spell out is very accurately reconstructed. In the end, we achieved about 90% accuracy with over a thousand possible words. Now, because it's a spelling, it's a little bit slower and due to a variety of reasons in our setup, it's a little bit slower at six words per minute. But we still felt that in addition to the first project, this was really an important step forward because for this to actually become usable, we need to give patients who need this technology access to a large vocabulary so that they can work, you know, they can express themselves more truly and fully. Okay, now to just briefly go over some next steps. So we have our system here, for example. So one of our main next steps is, well, I think all of our next steps are quite important. So the, in this next step, we want to show that you know, not everyone in the world speaks English, of course. And right now, a lot of the assistive technology, at least that I'm familiar with, I guess, here is it operates best in English. But there's no reason that our technology has to be limited in this way. So we want to show that our approach can work for many languages, not just English, to you know, really 
cover the diverse needs of the population. One other thing that we actually, I mentioned briefly before in an earlier slide, we have shown with the uh, epilepsy volunteers who we work with um, over the past decade, and still to this day, we work with them. We've shown in a prior study that they're speaking aloud and we can record brain activity as they speak aloud. And we can actually decode the acoustics of what they say, not just as text. And this can be nice, especially as we move towards really, really accurate decoding of the acoustics of speech. This has a lot of advantages because there's a lot of expression and expressivity that is contained in speech beyond just text. For example, you can tell if I ask a question, if I end a sentence like this, versus if I end it like this. So these kinds of things, what we call prosody, can have a lot of, that can play a major role in conveying meaning. And so we wanna work towards this goal also in the speech BCI, so that users can basically express themselves more fully than they could with just text. And then of course, in parallel, there is a major push right now in, in the research setting and in the industry setting to improve hardware, because hardware plays a really key role in what, what can be done with a BCI. And so you can imagine perhaps maybe with, <clears throat> instead of 128 channels, we have even more channels. And we've seen that this type of thing can lead to improved performance. So there's a lot of work being done there that um, I think we and others are very excited about. And then finally, this technology has to work for many people, not just Poncho. We want it to work for Poncho, but we know there's a lot of people who could benefit from this type of technology. And so that's why we are in our, in our ongoing clinical trial, we're still recruiting and, and trying to work with new participants to show that this isn't just a one-off. You know, this has to be a very reliable and feasible and well-validated interface to, to truly help as many people as possible. Okay, this is just, not everyone has worked on this project that you see, but here's a picture of many members of our lab on a, at the end of a hike, which we thought was very nice. But yeah, thank you everyone for listening. And yeah, that's the end of our presentation.